estoy impresionado. No paro de recorrer a través de mi pequeño celular, así es súper accesible, eh, Súper acomodado recorrerlo, todos los stands de actividades que están pasando en Pine, en este momento donde usted tiene que llenar su ficha, inscribirse y participar en 8.8, onceava versión ENTECA. ¿Sabes lo que significa ENTE? ¿ENTECA? No, no, no. Significa ONCE en griego. Para que lo sepa, el primer paso dentro de una nueva década y que nosotros lo hacemos pensando justamente en el futuro que ha cambiado de la humanidad. Ya hay un ganador, eh, me soplan por acá, de Karspersky, eh, que se llama Daniela Herrera, que es la primera persona que se acerca al stand de Karspersky, ve el video, se hace una pregunta y la responde rápidamente. Se ganó un 50% de descuento en los... Ah, mira, ese taller de ciberseguridad. Se ganó un tremendo descuento en un taller y un curso grande de eh, ciberseguridad. Ya lo saben, eh, Daniela Herrera, eh, se van a contactar contigo y te van a dar oficialmente la ceremonia de premiación por este concurso. Ahora... Con todo lo que nos cuesta armar todo este tremendo proyecto, tenemos dos tremendas eminencias que van a poder conversar con ustedes en la siguiente charla que tenemos para continuar a esta hora de almuerzo, donde usted ya se puede sentar con la cervecita, un plato de comida, frente a la pantalla, a disfrutar de esta tremenda, tremenda charla que tenemos a continuación. Nos encontramos con Pedro Fortuna, co-founder and CTO de Giz Scramble, que está por ahí. Eh, si no me equivoco, debería estar ya en mi pantalla. No, ah, está acá, acá, ah, ah, ¿a dónde? Ahí está, a la, a la izquierda. Perfecta. Hola. Hi, Pedro. How are, how are you? Hello, Jorge. Uh, I'm good. Excellent. Fine, fine. Thanks for your time, for being here, and thanks for all the knowledge you are sharing with us. Of course. And el doctor Jarvis Nagra, que también lo va a acompañar, que es parte también de Jesus Scramble. Hi, how are you fine? Doing great. Great to be here. Well, <laughs> thanks for your time again, and el espacio es todo de ellos. Comienza la presentación entonces nuestra nueva charla acá en nuestra onceava versión de 8.8 Security Conference. Awesome. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening, everyone, depending where you are today. Um, so, welcome to our talk on web isolation. So my name is Pedro Fortuna. I'm founder and CTO at J Scrambler. And I've basically been working in security for as long as I can remember. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jasper Nagara. Most people call me Jazz. You should too. You should definitely call me. Uh, uh, as uh, I should probably say, I've been working in security for as long as uh, Pedro can remember. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we want to start this talk with um, with a little story. Already, this is like very early in the morning for some people. Pedro, you want to tell a story? Yeah, I guess we we have to risk it. Um, so this is a story about a ship that most of you may have heard about. Uh, it's the Titanic. Uh, that's right, you guess it. And the reason why I'm telling you this story is because of the way it was built. Uh, it was built in Belfast in their famous shipyard. I was actually lucky enough to visit during the OWASP UPSEC EU in 2017. And it was inaugurated on April 10th of 1912 in the Southampton port in the UK. So I guess most people do not know this, but when the Titanic was built, it was bleeding edge in many ways. So the bottom of the ship was split into 16 major watertight compartments, uh, a technique to ensure the stability of the ship despite the presence of damage. It was called a two compartment ship because it could remain afloat with at least two adjacent watertight compartments completely flooded. That's like the worst situation they could imagine back then. So it was deemed to be unsinkable. But depending on the exact location of the hit, at best, it could withstand the flooding of up to four compartments without sinking. Uh, unfortunately, on April 15, uh, five days after the inauguration, it sank because it collided with a huge iceberg 
that resulted in the flooding of the forward six compartments. And two and a half years, hours later, the Titanic sank. So no one saw that coming, uh, that something, in this case an iceberg, could do this type of damage. They were overconfident that because of that, um, they only had 20 lifeboats, uh, clearly not enough for everyone. So the ship carried 2,224 people, including the crew, and only 710 were actually rescued, so roughly 31.9%. So even though it did not end well, compartmentalization was a great idea, and it is still used uh, in ship design to this day. Uh, so the basic idea is that damage on a single section of the ship does not compromise the whole ship. But the problem with the Titanic is that its implementation was flawed. But we'll tell you more about that later. Wait, are we, are you, are you leaving that as a cliffhanger there? <laughs> yeah, um, we are naughty, I guess. So uh, back to you, Jazz. Oh, um, um, no, th this is actually my part. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about a, a bit about the history of web isolation. So um, the first really at attempt at isolation inside the browser was introduced by the same origin policy, uh, where interactions between two different origins are restricted. But restricted how if we can embed third-party codes directly from third-party servers into our, our executing context. Uh, so this code here has the same level of privilege as any other uh, code from the same origin. So it turns out that embedding of third-party code is possible. What is restricted is some writing and reading raw data from cross-origin domains. So the reality is that the same origin policy is complex, uh, has lots of, lots of exceptions, and to this day, most developers do not fully understand it, which is a frequent source of security issues. Two years later, uh, we were given the iframes uh, with which we can isolate two cross-origin documents, uh, all scripts running on the same web app. But soon enough, people felt the need to poke a hole through it, coming, with up, coming up with different ways to have communication between two cross-origin documents. And only 13 years later, we threw the towel and finally made it official with uh, the introduction of the web messaging API, with which you can do post message between two cross-origin iframes. But not every problem went away. Frame, iframes had still too much power they could, for instance, um, navigate away the top window, uh, among other things. So it took a while, but 13 years later, iframe sandboxing was introduced, which greatly restricts what an iframe document can do. Um, so you can see a bunch of configuration attributes that you can use to relax some of the iframe default restrictions. So almost at the same time, uh, we got content security policy version one, uh, with which one could set a domain-based allow listing, uh, which was later found to be broken. So you can see that, you can see to the right a reference to a well-known paper from uh, Weichselbaum, Spagnuolo, Leckes, and Yank uh, that uh, detail everything uh, around this topic. But, uh, also, CSP is pretty hard to maintain, so especially version one. So later versions of CSP fixed that, but, but are not as straightforward to set up. So the main limitation that we see with CSP is that it does not cover all the behavioral angles that you want to restrict. So if you allow the scripts, uh, you allow the scripts entirely uh, so it can do everything it wants. So you want a more granular type of thing where you allow some things that the script may be able to do, but not everything. 
So the problem with this isolation and defense mechanisms is that, is that people will fight them, uh, will push for ways to relax them in uh, what they need in order to make the application work. Um, so things like JSONP and cores are good examples, but if the isolation mechanisms were more granular and configurable, perhaps we wouldn't feel the need to open holes in these protection mechanisms. So here's the timeline of these features. So you can see a huge gap between 97 and 2009 where you really have to wonder what the browser people were doing during these years. <laughs> uh, Pedro, at some point, I should tell you what we were doing at those, <laughs> during those years. We were <laughs> sitting back, relaxing a little. So uh, back to you, Jas, this time for real. <laughs> uh, sounds great. Like, so uh, a lot of what Pedro has talked about is uh, uh, what's built into the browser. Browsers provide us with, you know, a large number of great uh, basic primitives, all of the things uh, that, that give you, that make your units of isolation uh, smaller and stronger. And yes, they have problems, uh, but we can maybe do something to build uh, on top of that, right? And I think that the answer here is yes, and you shouldn't just believe me. Uh, the community uh, as a whole has built all kinds of interesting mechanisms on top of what isolation um, primitives that the browsers provide that um, you know reduce the number of holes you need to poke in your cheese, basically. Uh, Pedro, do you mind just driving those slides for me? Thanks. Uh, so roughly speaking, uh, it's, it's hard to characterize what all of the different uh, approaches for web isolation are. Uh, the way that I like to think about it is, you know, you, you, you can think about them on two axes, uh, where you uh, change the source code or virtualization, where you change uh, the code itself, or you are changing the environment in which the code runs. So I've plotted three projects here. Uh, just as a representative example, there's many more projects. Um, uh, there's, there's Google Kaha, which you know, I'm, I'm sort of deeply uh, familiar with and was involved with, uh, which uses a combination of virtualization and transformation to build a sandbox. Uh, so code is both changed and the environment in which this code runs is also modified so that, uh, so, so that the access that this uh, application has is limited. There's, uh, there is or was a JS reg which tried to do the same, but it was a more lightweight transformation. Uh, there's JScrambler, which, uh, which Pedro is intimately involved with, um, you know, which, which uses mostly virtualization, uh, which is a lighter weight transformation. But essentially all of these approaches for building on top of the primitives that the web uh, that the web browser provides falls somewhere in the spectrum. Um, let's uh, switch to the next slide. So, so what does this look like? Uh, let's take a simple JavaScript application. It consists of functions like uh, you see here is an alert which comes from somewhere else. Uh, if you're a um, if you're a systems kind of a person, you can think of this as, as system calls. They come you know, they're provided by the browser. You have strings, you have arrays. These are native types. And then you have functions which, you, which you've written yourself. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on this too long, but this transformation, this slide, which captures the transformation is my, is my most favorite transformation. Uh, everybody has their own favorite transformations. This one is mine, right? It's the basis for all the language transformation based sandboxes that you see. Now let's say you transform these functions so that whenever you reference a system call or a native object, you don't get the, you know, the native powerful object. Uh, what you get is uh, you only get those objects or those types or those functions that the caller controls. Now, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here. Some of you in the audience must already be saying, hey, Jazz, you forgot about eval. Hey, Jazz, you forgot about walking the prototype chain. There's like these constructs. And you're right. Absolutely, you are right. But at heart, 
this is the transformation that lets you call some arbitrary third party code in a controlled kind of way. Um, let's do the, yeah, perfect. Uh, and not, not only that, uh, you, you can do the same thing, not just for JavaScript, you can actually do this for HTML and for CSS uh, too. In fact, in some ways it's even easier uh, to do it for HTML and CSS because they are less expressive than JavaScript is. For example, uh, here, if you had some CSS rule that was you know, changing every div or every bold tag to be the color blue because you find the color blue beautiful, uh, you can prepend like a dot gadget one, two, three, uh, and, and, now, and now your, your colors are only restricted to the descendants of uh, a div that has, you know, gadget one, two, three uh, uh, a, 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 as a class, right? So th this, is, this is one tool in our tr uh, toolbox, transformation. What's the other tool that we have? So the other tool is virtualization. Now, I call it virtualization, but really all it is is polyfills. You all know it as polyfills. Uh, they present a feature, what is a polyfill? It presents a feature that is not present in a particular browser version. Virtualization is exactly like polyfills, uh, but we need them even if the feature exists uh, in the browser. But it's not redundant because we want to override the default behavior uh, or have a chance to trigger some additional, uh, let's, let's call them re reactions, okay. So here you have an example of a date. All browsers do, you can provide this just to a third party directly. No polyfill, polyfill needed, or the polyfill is just, you know, the, just a wrapper around the date. Maybe because you don't worry about cache timing attacks or from a particular third party. Now you have XHR, and you can provide a polyfill version that always proxies that request, so it doesn't let you go to arbitrary places. So you, you can prevent a third party from connecting to an arbitrary location, it always goes through your proxy. In fact, uh, in, you know, today every browser has uh, an XHR, but you know, if you remember the bad days, uh, not every browser would provide you with uh, XML HTTP requests, and you might need to polyfill that. Uh, the nice thing is that you can pr take something that is much more powerful, like an, like an ActiveX control would let you do crazy things, but because you are proxying them, because you sit between the third party and the browser, you can use a powerful object to provide an attenuated, like a, like a, a, a weaker, safer version of XHR built on top of ActiveX to third parties. And, and similarly, you can do this with like document location, uh, with, with, uh, um, with, with access to the camera, all kinds of things. The trick, the hard part, is the strong part for security needs to be that you create polyfills in a way that can't be bypassed. When you have a polyfill, of course everybody wants to use your polyfill because it's providing power that you don't ordinarily have. When you use polyfill, polyfills for security, um, you need to make sure that no one can bypass your polyfill. And all of the projects that use virtualization come up with, uh, with, with different ways of, of achieving that. Now, um, uh, next slide. Uh, so there are three principles I want you to take away from how native browser isolation features work. Boil down, they do things like, you know, same origin policy, iframes, et cetera. What do they bring? Now, the three, and it's an interesting set of three, and you might already be starting to get hints to that little cliffhanger that we left behind. The most obvious design principle is compartment size. Now, you can have an entire domain or origin, you can have whole pages, you can have iframes, you can have individual scripts, you can have individual functions, you can have individual actions that these functions are taking, like specific API uh, uh, calls. The smaller the compartment, the more resilient a web application uh, that you uh, ship uh, will be. Uh, the the trade-off you're making here is there's a lot more decisions that you need to make the longer is the setup time and the configuration effort. Next slide. The second thing is uh, the, the isolation material. The stronger the material is, the more resilient uh, your web application would be. Now, drilling holes even into strong materials weakens them. Uh, 
uh, iframe, CSV, the mechanisms that we use to do isolation are weakened because in order to get our job done, we need to poke holes into them. Now, these holes aren't there because you know web browser implementations are broken, but because the isolation mechanism doesn't necessarily align with the, with the way in which you, we use it. Developers will find clever ways. You all are very clever at finding ways to poke holes into them in order to get you know, your job done. Which brings us to the third thing, uh, w w which is visibility and user friendliness. Now, developers are people too. They need APIs that work well for their particular use case and for their threat model. Now, some materials like same origin policy and iframes work for the threat models that existed way back when, but they haven't kept up with how you know, web developers develop today. And they do not provide you with any visibility, at least not out of the box. And this brings us back to the cliffhangers. Pedro? Yeah, so like we said, the Titanic implementation was flawed. Um, so by now, you, you should be able to guess it, but the compartments uh, were, were still too big. Uh, and the materials were definitely not iceberg ready. So they needed uh, stronger materials. Uh, the damage model was incomplete or incorrect, which translating to our context, it means that the threat model was wrong. And finally, the lack of visibility. So for obvious reasons, no one spotted the, the iceberg in time. So visibility and analytics, which is a, an interpretation of what, what's happening, are definitely essential uh, for our uh, web isolation. So now we have some time for, for doing some demos. Um, in these demos, we'll be using the same scenario throughout. Um, uh, we'll be using a login page for a mock-up uh, banking website. And this website uses a third-party chatbot service. So in some of the runs, we'll replace the regular chatbot script uh, for a compromised version that it's attempting to leak the login credentials of the user. So you'll see a few options in the bottom that allow me to reload the website with different demo settings, okay? So let's start uh, with the baseline. So uh, we'll show you an example of what happens when isolation is lacking. Um, so let me start this full screen. So this is the, the dummy virtual bank website. And, um, and as you can see, it has first party codes, but it also has a chatbot um, script that it's being loaded directly from the third party server, chatbot.js. So it's not really doing anything uh, because this is a mock-up chatbot. Uh, so that is the icon of the chatbot. Uh, it's not really doing anything, uh, but this is a mock-up demo, so it doesn't matter. So obviously being embedded, it can hurt uh, security. So let us do another run with, uh, with a compromised version of the same script. This is the, the compromised version of the script. It has additional code that is hooking into the onSubmit function of the form. So it will run a malicious function when the user clicks submit, which will capture the user and password and XHR it to malicious-api.jscramble.com and will resume the form submission. So the user will not notice that something uh, odd is happening. So let me log in. And uh, I'll show you in the, in the attacker dashboards the captured uh, credentials. Okay, so as you can see, uh, that malicious code was able to capture the credentials. Okay, so, um, so next, uh, what we'll be doing um, is showing you uh, uh, the first thing that uh, most application owners would do in this situation. Uh, so they want to remove 
the uh, full access that this third party script has to your web app by isolating the scripts into uh, a cross origin iframe. Okay. Um, okay. So let me move to the second demo. So we'll be loading the compromised version inside an iframe. And the first, sorry, let me full screen this so you can see. Okay. So the first thing that you'll notice once we reload the page is that you're getting a console error. Okay. So, um, so this is basically the consequence of loading the chatbot script inside the iframe. And we are using a subdomain for that. So it's not running in uh, virtualbank.com. It's actually running in chatbot.virtualbank.com. Okay, so it's a, it's a subdomain. Subdomain by default is considered to be cross-origin. And the scripts is unchanged. So it tries to access the form directly, but it cannot find it in the HTML. Okay, so however, we, even though we have mitigated the problem, uh, this can potentially require re-engineering uh, of the web app um, or even requesting the service provider to change how the service works. And re-engineering the web app is quite complex. And, um, and, and uh, it may require a protocol uh, to, to define how we post message things back and forth between the main window and the third party service running in the isolated iframe. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, an analytic service expects direct access to the full DOM of the web app. Um, so it's no wonder that many websites end up just um, adding the scripts directly uh, to the main window, uh, despite the risk. So, and this brings us to demo number three, which I'll ask Jazz to do. Uh, sure. Do you want to full screen it before you play it? Yep. Uh, so, so the part of the problem was uh, was the asynchronous uh, running of the code. Like that's what is causing it to be so difficult. Um, here, Kaha tries to avoid that. Let's start by enabling Kaha and rerunning this compromised script. Now remember, the script that we are about to compromise here isn't supposed to have access to the network to do its job. Normally, um, we enable Kaha. I'm, I'm actually using something called Secure X, ExmaScript instead of Kaha, actually, but it's derived from Kaha. Uh, what are we doing here? We create a compartment. We whitelist just the APIs that are needed for, for the legitimate script to do its job. In this case, the only things that are needed are create element and append child. Um, we rerun the script. The thing that you're noticing is that there's no network request made. Uh, and if we go to the, uh, to the attacker server, we find no additional content was exfiltrated. Why? Because the third party script was granted access to just what it needed. It needed a pen child, it needed create element, it did not need network access. And so it wasn't that we took that away. We basically started by taking everything away and then only giving back the power that the script needed for it to do its job and it could do it synchronously as opposed to in the iframe case, asynchronously. Uh, Pedro, do you wanna do the next one actually? Of course. So let me, oh, sorry. Okay, so um, so to avoid this caveat, uh, we developed a, a sandboxing solution that can be seamlessly be integrated into any web app. Uh, you just have to add a, a script, an agent, and you get immediately uh, immediately you get visibility on what third parties are doing, and we can use rules to either allow or disallow such behaviors. So let me start the demo. So uh, in this dashboard, you'll be able to see what's going on. So right now it's completely empty. Um, so we'll reload the virtual bank app 
with both the compromise script and our agents and to see what's going on. So after a few seconds, we see things landing uh, in the dashboard. So in this case, we see that the on submit event handler was replaced. We can see the IP address, the user agent, and we can see in full detail what form was targeted and the malicious function that was set by the attacker. So we can see in full detail. Right now, we are not blocking it. Um, and we have confirmation that it was chatbot compromise.js that was doing this. OK. So let us move forward, nevertheless. So we're not blocking this, but we already have visibility and see what happens. So the next thing that we get is uh, an alert uh, about the exfiltration of the data. Uh, so we can see the endpoint and what data is being passed. And again, we can see what was the script that uh, triggered this action. So obviously, uh, visibility is nice. And here we can see confirmation that the credentials were captured. Visibility is nice, but we need to mitigate it. So the first thing that we are doing is creating a rule to prevent the exfiltration. So in this rule, you can see uh, in which, which pages the rule is running, uh, which scripts uh, this, this particular rule will be applied to, and which events we are controlling. So in this case, we are uh, restricting any network requests whose destination.domain equals malicious-api.jscramble.com. Okay, so the action we set to alert and block, so we're doing two things. And I don't need to save the rule because it's already there. So I'm enabling the rule and applying the configuration. So at this point, we'll need to wait a few seconds for the deployment um, to be complete. And next, uh, we'll do another run to see what changed. OK, so let's wait a couple more seconds. All right. And let's reload the page and see what happens. So a few seconds later, we'll get uh, the same on submit event handler being replaced. So we, we, we did nothing regard that uh, up until this moment. But we are preventing the exfiltration. So that malicious function is running. And when it tries to exfiltrate, it will be blocked by the isolation layer. So as you can see, there's no additional entries in the attacker's dashboard. So obviously, we can do better. Um, we can also prevent that uh, event handler function to for replacing the original one. Um, and we already have a rule for that as well. So sorry, let me. OK, so what we are doing here is let me. So we have a, um, a rule for that. So what we are doing here is we are creating a rule that will be applied to every page in the websites, regardless of what scripts. And we are blocking any behavioral change that targets a form. If that happens, we will alert, but also block the event. OK, so again, um, Again, we need to enable this rule and apply the configuration. I'll just fast forward this bit for your benefit. And the next thing I'll do is uh, I'll do a final run to see what changed. OK, so I need to reload the page. And right about now, the on submit event handler replacing was already attempted, but was blocked by the rule. OK? And this is it. So uh, two comments. So this demo may lead you to think that, um, that you need to find about things, and only then block it. Uh, but the, the rules engine actually allows you to set allow lists uh, for all sorts of things. For example, you can name one script that needs access to a given form. 
and every other access will be blocked by default um, and, and thus reducing the attack surface. So we can do the same for cookies, for local storage, and for a number of other things, other behaviors, other, other resources. So you can, you can set the terrain um, to be secure by default uh, without the actual need to be waiting for something to happen. Uh, also, the rules are quite flexible and granular, which means that our isolation boxes uh, can be as small as we want without having to re-engineer the whole web app. Okay, so... So, this talk is, is coming to the end, uh, but we still need to address the challenges ahead. Um, to understand the challenges, it helps understanding what we have been doing wrong. Uh, in terms of browser-based security, uh, the security features that provide isolation, things have moved slow and erratically. And the reason is because that was never one feature whose purpose was to provide full isolation for browser-based apps. So isolation has been more about stitching together a bunch of different mechanisms and try to cover as much surface as possible. Um, this is both complex and error prone and uh, inevitably leaves some holes or blind spots. So behind the browser, there are other few initiatives, uh, some of which we already mentioned, uh, that try to come up with a holistic approach for client-side web isolation. So we, we mentioned Kaha, uh, but sadly Kaha was eventually uh, discontinued. And more recently, we have been working on web page integrity. Um, and, and there are maybe a couple that are, uh, that are also valuable out there. So just- what do, we need, what do we need for the next 20 years? I, uh, Pedro has covered you know, what we did. Uh, you know, the web is evolving. It's evolving at a very fast pace. We're moving more and more things onto the web. and it's highly decentralized. We're in order to build your applications to, today. You glue together large numbers of third-party services. So, what does the next thirty uh, next twenty years look like? What what I assert we need. What we're our perspective is. What we need is a single holistic client-side um, web solution that covers all of these angles. Right? We need a broad and coherent plan. And there's three principles that we've talked about today, which is reducing the size of the compartment, uh, making each one of the compartments, each one of the units stronger and uh, developer friendly. You know, aligned with how the web is used today, not how we were using it back in the day. As we were making this presentation, uh, Pedro and I joked, I, I make terrible puns, I'm sorry, but we, we, we we joked that the way to make a ship unsinkable is to sort of give it wings. And I think that that's what we need to do is to give, you know, is to give the Titanic wings. Uh, let's, let's talk about how far along we are. Um, parts of the solution. We have the ones that we've been talking about today that, that go fairly far into this vision. But ambitious plans take time. There are lots of pieces on the way here. Uh, in a couple of years, the maturity of these solutions will help make not just each part work well, but work better with each other um, and, and drive adoption. We were ironing out bugs. Uh, Pedro mentioned CSP. Uh, that was an attempt. And we found some rough corner cases. And we, over time, polished them. Uh, we, we, over time, polished them. Now, in spite of the analogy that we've been making here, the plan is not actually to build an unsinkable ship. It's to lift web application security a little bit out of the water, so we're not constantly, um, so that we're not constantly drowning. So we call the security community, you and I, like all of us, uh, to to join us and and help continue to push. Um, Web isolation in particular as a mechanism that we use to mitigate uh, the extent to which 
we are vulnerable to third party scripts uh, and hopefully we'll all meet you in the future. Um, take care. Um, and that's all we have for today. So thank you very much. It was wonderful to be here today. Uh, we we'll, would also like to pay our respects to the late Sir Clive Sinclair. He was uh, an inventor and a genius. Personally, uh, he's responsible for me pursuing a career in computer science. It was a huge loss for a generation that fell in love with computers because of his inventions. So thank you again, and we are happy to take your questions now. To you for the knowledge. I have a few questions. What's your opinion about the firewall from the apps and web? Can you hear me? Can now. Yes. Okay. What is your opinion on the firewall from the apps web? Sorry. Can you can you rephrase that again? From okay. from the. What is your opinion of the firewall from the apps, the application of web? I, I'm not sure I got the question. Jazz, do you have, do you, did you get the question? So, I, 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 not entirely, but I can guess a question. <laughs> so no, maybe no, no, I'm no, answering no. a different question. People ask me about the, your opinion about the firewall yeah. from the na natural web app applications. Right, so I, I'll, 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 I'll be brief about this, right? So uh, I think that in general, uh, web applications have moved away from, uh, you know, from, we call them perimeter security because, you know, web firewalls, firewalls in general are, uh, you know, a, a, a hard, crusty exterior and a soft, gooey center, right? And so uh, uh, once upon a time when web applications were mostly documents, that worked really well because, you know, you'd have, uh, you, you, you'd, you know, build this boundary, you know, like the, the, the great firewall of China or, uh, you know, you'd build a boundary and as long as the attacker was not able to get through this boundary, you were good. If you think about it, web applications uh, are, are active applications. This means that the, the, the attacker <laughs> could be inside your perimeter. And so firewalls tend not to work so well in those uh, set of circumstances. A lot of the tooling that I was describing today around virtualization is you know, if you squint right, it's moving the firewall from way out, you know, out in the boundaries, all the way inside your application, so that each one of your each one of your APIs is surrounded by um, uh, by, by a, a, a sort of virtualized firewall. And the reason why that is powerful is because uh, you know that that means that you have context on what needs to be what needs to be running. Um, so overall, I think firewalls worked once upon a time. I think that the way in which the web works now means that, you know, we, we need to pull these firewalls all the way uh, inside our application. I think that those and only those are going to end up giving you the kind of, you know, sort of zero trust security that we need. Charles, uh, if I'm allowed to add something there, uh, the question could be uh, related with web application firewalls and, and from a technical standpoint, there's uh, some interesting differences that we, we want to, to communicate here. Uh, so basically a WAF, a web application firewall, is usually placed between the back end and the front end. Uh, but uh, the way it's uh, deployed, it will only actually screen communications between that back end and the browser, which means that in our demo, for instance, the exfiltration was done to a third party domain, and that communication was not covered by the WAF. The WAF wouldn't be able to look at that communication or any other communication that it's not being directed to the application backend. Uh, on top of this, WAFs, they look at code statically. They look at code that it's not running at that moment. They look at responses. Um, so they have to deal with uh, trying to figure out what that code will be doing once it reaches the browser and, and once it starts running. 
And that's very hard to, to, to do uh, unless you're considering like very low hanging fruit stuff. It's very hard to do because there are plenty of ways to hide, um, to really hide because uh, JavaScript is really easy to, to modify how it looks. It's very easy to statically hide what it will be doing. So we argue that uh, doing that kind of screening on the browser and doing dynamic analysis rather than static analysis is the right approach because it doesn't matter how the code looks like. What matters is what behaviors that code is trying to engage. And using virtualization, you are, uh, you are in the middle of that so you can control uh, and you have actual confirmation of the behavior that it's about to happen. Okay. The last one. How this solution helps developers to fix their code apart from mitigating the risk? Um, so so th this is not meant to fix the code. This is meant to, to provide visibility. Uh, to help security uh, practitioners to understand the, the, the type of threats that are usually um, targeting uh, these websites. Um, it, it does nothing in order to make developers uh, produce better code. Uh, there are, of course, some, some, uh, some, uh, some good practices uh, that you should uh, follow whenever you can, but this is not the purpose of, of uh, this type of approach, uh, web isolation. What it can help is that even when uh, the developer uh, does a poor job um, um, isolating things like using iframes or, uh, or separating concerns, separating scripts, um, it still it gets the protection from the isolation. And the cost of adding that isolation is uh, almost for free because the, at least from the developer's point of view, um, he or she uh, does not need to do anything differently in order to benefit from that protection. Jazz, I don't know if you want to add something here. I, I definitely do. Uh, just to keep things spicy, I'm gonna disagree <laughs> with you. <laughs> <laughs> this is always fun. No, no, I, I mean, you of course are right. This is not the purpose. But actually, virtualization does two things that make developers' experience much better. One is it does give you the, you know, the, the visibility that you need. And now, of course, you know, security people want visibility because we want to know what the bad guys are up to. Bad guys are like sneaking around, and we want that visibility. But if you think about it, when you are debugging, you're essentially an attacker on your own code. And like essentially giving that visibility makes the life of a developer that much easier because suddenly you get all of this visibility that you did not previously have, didn't prevent you from putting the bugs in in the first place. But now that you've put the bugs in, really helpful. I, I personally have used, you know, these virtualization tricks that we've talked about to debug code, you know, that idiot that Jazz was six months ago wrote. Right? So visibility is, I think, really provided by tools like it. I would love to see more of them. The other is the thing that you allude to, which is isolation. Now, isolation means that you know the bad guy can't hurt you, but it also means that you can't hurt you by accident, right? So you know, of course, it is the case that you know the attacker is trying to maliciously do bad things to you, but if things are isolated, think about it not in terms of security, but as modularity, right? The more isolated your code is, that means that this piece here can't hurt this piece here because it's been isolated. If everything was sitting in the same sandbox, then you know, you'd be hurting each other even if you were writing the code because you, know, you just could not keep it separated in your head. And so, so I do think that yes, it pro it's not built to make the life of developers easier. But I think that in both of these cases, both visibility and isolation help make uh, developers' lives easier. It certainly has made my life easier. We disagree or not, you are an amazing guy. Thanks very much for your time, for being here uh, to make this possible. Uh, and I don't know, nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, <laughs> for being here. Thank you so Thank much. You.
Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Y bueno, continuamos, seguimos avanzando, entramos en tierra derecha, ya parte de la tarde, y eh, parte de inmediato, si se dirigen, eh, déjenme decirles al el minuto, ¿qué sponsor está realizando algún concurso para poder ganar alguna de las tantas cortesías y maravillas que tenemos el día de hoy en nuestro evento virtual a través de la plataforma Pine para que la vayan conociendo, se vayan familiarizando obviamente y participen también eh, de los concursos que tienen los diferentes sponsors dame cinco segundos, estoy buscando dónde está, dónde estás corazón no oigo tú palpitar acá está, eso, ya a esta hora nos toca exactamente Karspersky. Van a haber preguntas de Karspersky para que estén dispuestos. Tienen que dirigirse eh, desde las 2.10 hasta las 2.20 al stand de Karspersky a través del sidebar de patrocinadores. Y ojo, para lo alto también, en este minuto, hasta el final de este minuto y un poquito más adelante, van a realizar un sorteo de premios sorpresas en su stand. Palo Alto está realizando premios eh, sorpresas de están. Ojo, que, ese, que esos premios están realmente increíbles. A ver si me soplan qué otras joyas pueden estar regalando por ahí, querida Javi. La Javi, ¿sabes? Le quiero mandar un saludo, que es nuestra chica, nuestra ejecutiva encargada de administrar a nuestros patrocinadores, la cual ha hecho un trabajo notable. Gracias, Valentina Castelli, al equipo Francisco Fuensalida. El clásico pasito para Boraz que nos está viendo ahora a través de la pantalla mientras que comparte la información con toda la prensa nacional e internacional para que sepan en el fondo cómo se está desarrollando 8.8. Y bueno, voy a ver después a la vuelta de la pequeña tanda eh, audífonos inalámbricos en Palo Alto. Están regalando audífonos inalámbricos a correr, señores, a buscar el stand de Palo Alto de inmediato porque los que visitan el stand, el stand podrán participar en el sorteo de... Eh, 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 Fono inalámbrico para que participe en cortesía de eh, Palo Alto. Partieron de inmediato al Size Bar y a buscar. Mientras tanto, nosotros nos vamos a dar un pequeño espacio y vamos a invitar a todos los otros auspiciadores que hacen posible realizar este tremendo evento, este magno evento, para que tengan un espacio al aire mientras preparamos la siguiente visita. Porque 8.8, la onceava versión de la conferencia de ciberseguridad más importante de nuestro país, se está llevando a cabo a través de nuestra señal en, en inscripción en Pathline, pero a través de nuestra señal en Pine. Inscríbase, participe y llene su ficha y sea parte de este evento que parte hoy día, continúa mañana y tenemos muy, muy buen contenido. Ojo que está espectacular la tarde para terminar. Así que nos vamos a una pequeña pausa y volvemos de inmediato acá en 8.8.